There we go. Okay. That picture is slightly smaller, but that'll be all right. Okay, our first item that changed St. Clair is the building of Fort Sinclair, which began in 1764. Uh, by Lieutenant Patrick Sinclair, who was with the British Army in Detroit, but actually working for the British Navy in Detroit. And he was given orders to build a fort at the mouth of the Pine River. And that September of 1764, the Gladwin, a ship he commanded, docked in the Pine River and begin to prepare for the construction of the fort. Now the glad one was built actually by Sinclair in Detroit and it looked a whole lot like the welcome. And yes, there are two L's there and there are supposed to be. Um, that ship was reconstructed uh, a few years back at Fort Michel Mackinac and has sailed on the lakes. Um, Patrick Sinclair, we have on the right, that silhouette is the only picture of him that we've ever been able to find. And it obviously was when he was an older man. When he was here in 1764, he was a young man. Uh, his career had begun in the Army. He was actually in the Black Watch during the French and Indian War, or in Europe, the Seven Years' War. He fought in the Caribbean and then in New York, where he got involved with the fighting on Lake Ontario and liked that kind of military action, so he stuck with it as long as he could. Uh, the fort here was both an army and a navy base. Uh, the purpose was to protect <coughs> the shipping the British had on the river from Detroit up through the St. Clair River to Michilimackinac. Uh, that was a main route of the fur trade and militarily very important to the British. So they didn't want anything to interfere with that. And this was right after uh, Pontiac's rebellion. So that gave you know, added reason or added worry for the British. But Sinclair, had some ideas on his, for himself. He was uh, from Scotland, northern Scotland, uh, from the landed gentry, but even the landed gentry in northern Scotland had a hard time making a living. So he had the idea here that he would make his own estate here in the wilderness, and he convinced some of the local Indian chiefs to deed to him 4,000 acres of land uh, along the St. Clair River, both north and south of the fort. He had a lot of plans for it. He began to plant uh, orchards, clear some fields. They did start uh, growing some oats and some uh, wheat. Uh, he hoped to settle families here. But more important as far as income would go would be a trading post. He called his estate and his trading post, which was inside the fort, the Pinery. And it quickly became the commercial center of this whole region. And people who lived in the region came here to do business. Uh, but fur traders would also come here, buy their supply of goods, and then go off for uh, long distances to by first from the Indians. Uh, the Ford Trading Post got its supplies from British merchants in Detroit. So there was a close connection between the, uh, the businesses there and this trading post. He built a sawmill in 1768, about four miles up the Pine River, and began to ship lumber to Detroit. It, a lot of people wonder, you know, why would they come this far to get uh, logs for lumber? But the Pine River was the southern border of the pine forests in Michigan. 
So Detroit had you know, trees, but not the kind they needed for lumber. So they came up to the Sinclair River area. And the mill he built perhaps looked like that one. Uh, that's Old Mission Creek, which is uh, up near uh, Mackinac City. It's a reconstruction of a British, for, a British mill that was there, built in 1780. So a similar time period, uh, built by the British. In fact, Sinclair in 1780 was at Michelin Mackinac. He was the commander there and was preparing to move the fort to the island. By 1783, the American Revolution has ended. Michigan and the Treaty of Paris have been given to the United States. It'll take the British another 10 years to actually leave Detroit. But the war is over, and the British are pulling back, and they don't see the necessity of uh, manning this fort up here. So the last of the soldiers, sailors, were taken back to Detroit, and the fort abandoned. The trading post in it, however, was not, and it uh, continued in business for uh, a few years, we're not sure how many, at least five, under other people, the Detroit merchants. The sawmill continued to op be operating, too, for a number of years, and in fact, in 1793, it was replaced by a larger mill, which unfortunately burned in 1803 and was not rebuilt. But this was the beginning of the city, and it was never uh, totally abandoned. In fact, even after 1803, there was a, a shingle mill here uh, on the north side of the river. Uh, and some people living here, uh, particularly along the shoreline there of the Sinclair River near the fort, kind of where the uh, Cargill Salt Company is today. Uh, Sinclair's own private home uh, was outside the fort. We don't know exactly where, but it was rented to um, people at different times and uh, stood for uh, quite a long time afterward. Um, but gradually the fort deteriorated. Okay, number two, 1818. And this is when James Fulton comes here and purchases uh, a plot of land on the north side of the Pine River. And uh, he was the Macomb County Sheriff. And this was all part of Macomb County then. Uh, but he also was a real estate developer in uh, Mount Clemens area and now he's going to be here. Uh, his plant basically was Clinton Avenue north to Thornapple and then back to 6th Street. So not really that large. He built his own house. You can see the arrow where it is. That block is just south of the library today. So he had a house there and he attached a, a jail on the back of it. Uh, his brother-in-law, John Thorne, uh, bought two lots from him at the foot of Thorne Street, which is now Thornapple, and he built a house and a store and lived there for a number of years. Later, uh, Thorne moved to Port Huron and is considered one of the founders of Port Huron. Uh, Fulton led the movement to have St. Clair County separated from Macomb County, and he was successful in that. And then he uh, lobbied uh, Governor Cass to uh, make his little settlement here the county seat, and was successful in that. Uh, he had to promise, however, to build a courthouse, set aside land for it, set aside land for churches and schools which he did. Uh, he didn't make money. In 1824, he was for, facing foreclosure. So uh, Thomas Palmer purchased his little town site. Uh, Palmer uh, was from Detroit. 
he never lived here. He always lived in Detroit, but he had a tremendous influence on the future of the, the town. Um, Palmer was uh, mostly a lumberman. He uh, had lumber interests in a lot of areas of Michigan, and that was his real interest here. Uh, he bought this town site, but he also began to buy more and more plots of land until he owned 20,000 acres of timberland in this area and began to ship lumber to Detroit. Uh, eventually, eight sawmills are in and around the city of St. Clair, so it became a lumbering community. Uh, one of the mills is this one, which was at the mouth of the Pine River on the south side, so that north end of the cargo property. Uh, it was one founded by uh, Palmer with a man named Munson, although it later is known as the Palmer Jerome Mill. It was the first steam-driven sawmill in Michigan. That was 1834. <clears throat> he tried water and all sorts of other things first, and none of them worked. So he went to steam. Uh, now, Palmer is going to expand uh, uh, the town. Uh, he hired a man who became a well-known uh, map maker from Detroit, John Farmer, to uh, make a new plot map. And he added three streets to the north, uh, Vine, Orchard, and Mulberry, and changed the name of Thorn to Thornapple, but they think to just go along with the other names. Uh, he also changed all the other names in the streets, the east-west streets, and added 7th Street to the west. Uh, the map I have here is actually an 1854 map by another well-known map maker, uh, William Hancock. This one uh, was probably ordered um, by Wesley Truesdale, who in 1854-53 was the largest landowner in St. Clair. Uh, we have this map in the museum here. Where Fulton failed, Palmer is going to be very successful. Uh, he begins to attract people to buy lots in his town, come here, live, start businesses. And he encouraged that too by starting businesses himself including the first store, which was called the <coughs> St. Clair Adventure. Uh, adventure was actually a word that was used uh, for uh, a business. If we look at the old ledgers of the Fort Trading Post, <coughs> they talk about the adventure in St. Clair, the business in St. Clair. Uh, this store, he uh, went into business with his brother Titus Palmer, and Titus came here and lived and ran the store. Uh, and there's a picture of his house. Uh, that is from a bird's eye view map made in 1868, and he, he had this large white house that was on the corner of Witherill and Ninth. Um, His brother George, eh, whose wife was Deborah, uh, they came here to live and they had a two acre farm right at the southern end of town. So I, if you go down to Jet's Pizza, their house was right about there. And where all those trees are, where that street dead ends, was their farm. It ran from the St. Clair River to the Pine River and included what became Hillside Cemetery. Uh, he gave that land for the cemetery. Uh, he was a, a leading citizen for a very long time. Uh, most of those streets in that area, Lydia and Harriet and, uh, and Juliet, those were all his daughters. <laughs> Another brother, Andrew, who was a younger brother, uh, came here in the 1820s. He settled out of town, though, on the Pine River on Gratiot. Gresham Avenue, and a sawmill and a tavern out there. In the 1820s, he also helped build uh, Indian Trail Road uh, to uh, Bell River Mills. And it's in the 1830s and 40s when Sinclair really grew rapidly. Uh, you can see 
in 1830 when Palmer is really getting things going. There were only 102 people here. But by 1845, there were over 1,000. So a lot, of, a lot of building going on. Titus Palmer's son was Friend Palmer, which is an interesting name. Uh, but uh, he, Friend Palmer also had an uncle in Detroit named Friend Palmer who was a judge. Uh, Friend bought the block east of his father, Titus, and built this house on the corner of Witherell and 7th. It's still there and looks pretty much the same. It was built by 1845. Uh, Titus um, became a, a leader in the community, as did his wife, uh, Joanna. And there's Joanna and there's three daughters. Uh, Thomas Palmer started a lot many businesses, as we said. Uh, he um, also uh, made good on Fulton's promise to build a courthouse. Um, the courthouse, we do not have a picture of. We have descriptions. We know it's two-story. It was logged. The logs were covered with clapboard, siding, and painted white. So it perhaps looked like the Lapeer County Courthouse if it didn't have those columns, that portico, mm -hmm. uh, which was pretty typical public building uh, for small communities uh, in the early 1800s. Later on, we'll have this larger brick courthouse. Now, Palmer's, uh, well, actually, Fulton's plat map to begin with, uh, set aside a whole block for the uh, courthouse, which is, if you can see it on this map, this is where the, this courthouse is. That's where the library is today. The block here was to be a public park, mm -hmm. as was this land here along the river. So from the courthouse, you could look right down to the river. Now, Palmer's son was also Thomas Palmer, but uh, this is Senator Thomas Palmer, who uh, never lived here except for when he was a boy in the 1840s. His father sent him up here to go to the St. Clair Academy, and uh, uh, Palmer had uh, encouraged, probably paid for, uh, a local minister by the name of Orrin Thompson to open this academy in St. Clair, and he sent his son here to, uh, to attend school. Others came from outside the community to go to school there too, and they uh, boarded with families in town. Uh, Senator Palmer often remembered his boyhood here. He uh, enjoyed himself here. He, he liked St. Clair, and he would sometimes uh, return. Uh, he later on um, was ambassador to Spain, or technically minister to Spain. Uh, he headed the uh, U.S. commission that oversaw the um, Columbian Exposition in 1893, the Chicago World's Fair. When he died, uh, his will was pretty much published in the uh, St. Clair Republican newspaper, uh, who he gave all or left all his money to, mostly to charity, but you know some uh, parts of it went to local Palmer relatives. So we'll move on to number three, four, 1825, and shipbuilding starts in St. Clair. Now St. Clair County was. Uh, probably in the 19th century built more ships than anywhere else in the lakes. And St. Clair uh, got in on that business too. Uh, beginning with two schooners that were built here in 1825, the Grand Turk and the Pilot. Fortunately, there aren't pictures of them. We'd like to see those. But the Grand Turk, we know, uh, was built by Levi Barber, and he probably built it um, where his home was on the Pine River. So approximately where 10th Street uh, is, 
attempt in uh, Fred Moore. Um, it was commissioned by Louis St. Bernard and piloted by his son Alexander. Uh, Alex St. Bernard became a very well-known pilot on the Great Lakes, uh, best known for piloting uh, the U.S. military ship, uh, the Michigan, which also was at one time called the Wolverine. Um, the St. Bernards lived north of town and settled here in 1814, so they were one of the early families here. Part of their farm is still owned by uh, a member of the same family and is uh, recently was designated a uh, bicentennial farm and featured in an article in the uh, Historical Society of Michigan's uh, magazine, The Chronicle, and then more recently in their magazine uh, for children, uh, Michigan History for Kids. A shipyard, an early shipyard was established here, and on the map it is right here. Uh, it was not a really huge one, but they did build some large ships there. Uh, the Pine River here, so this is uh, where Cargill is. This was a mill owned by Wesley Truesdale. It's the old Palmer Mill, and probably Truesdale owned the shipyard. He commissioned two ships to be built there uh, in the 1840s, the Goliath and the Empire State. And luckily there is this picture of the Empire State. Both of these ships were considered very modern, very innovative, and very large for their day. Unfortunately, they both uh, had terrible accidents very soon. <laughs> Uh, they didn't uh, sail for very long. Uh, the Goliath's steam engine exploded out of Lake Huron, and the Empire State uh, sank after several years. Uh, but Truesdale owned four sawmills. He owned a lot of land. He uh, had banking interests. Uh, he came here to uh, run the, the Bank of St. Clair in the 1840s which moved to Detroit in the 1830s, moved to Detroit in the 1840s. Uh, Simon Langeau um, built ships in the 1860s <coughs> in that little shipyard, and he, but he found it too small, and you had to launch ships kind of head first into the river, which uh, was not what people liked to do. They liked to side launch them. So, in 1872, he began to build his own shipyard on the Pine River, uh, right in that first bend um, where those big tanks are today, which are next to the harbor, kind of included part of that harbor today. And then, so this became a major industry when you're building wooden ships of that sort. Uh, this is the Simon Langell, and it's very typical of the type of ship he built. Uh, the heyday of building these wooden ships was the decade of the 1880s. He had so much business, you know, they, they were uh, feverishly, um, feverishly uh, building. Um, and you have the picture of the harbor up there. You can see the ships were actually built on what's that vacant land right on the curve of the river. Some pictures of buildings that were still there in the 1960s before they built the harbor. A few other ships that he built there. Uh, most of these ships were kind of in the 250 foot length. Uh, the Welcome was one of the latter ones he built in the 1890s. It um, was a, a steam ferry and operated out of St. Clair for many years. Some ship launchings at uh, Langell Yard. The whole town would come to watch a ship launched. It was a, a big community celebration. Uh, they'd even let the schools out and you know the students would all come and watch it being launched.
by 1900, wooden ships that Langell built are no longer being built. Uh, steel hulled ships are what uh, the companies want. Uh, so in 1903, uh, Port Huron investors, uh, headed by William Jenks of the Jenks Shipyard in Port Huron, opened a shipyard just south of the city limits on the St. Clair River called Columbia Ironworks. Uh, today, through the middle of that shipyard is a residential street called St. Clair Shores Boulevard. Um, Columbia started two uh, ships there. They didn't complete them. It, they were purchased by Great Lakes Engineering Works, who did complete them, and then built 11 more ships there in the next few years. The yard only uh, was open for seven years. Um, oops. They also built these. These are the sections of the railroad tunnel that's uh, under the Detroit River between Detroit and Windsor. They were built here, towed down to Detroit, and sunk into a trench in the bottom of the St. Clair River. You see how huge they were, or are. <coughs> Uh, why this shipyard didn't last beyond 1910 is the materials to build the ships. They're not readily available here, so they decided to move the shipyard to Ashtabula, Ohio, where they'd be near the steel mills of you know, eastern Ohio and Pittsburgh and the coal fields. Uh, so they simply closed this one up and moved everything to Ashtabula. Eighteen sixty-three. Another industry uh, started. It struggled for a while, and this is the salt industry. And in eighteen sixty-three, uh, a man named E. Spangler opened a, a salt well and began to produce um, a barrel every five minutes, which sounds pretty good. However, he never made any money and soon had to go out of business. But in 1880, Charles F. Moore reopened the old Spangler well, and he hired Crockett McElroy, who lived in St. Clair, to uh, head up the work and try and uh, get it going. Um, McElroy had some experience in this. Uh, he owned uh, the Marine City Stave Company, which was right on Catholic Point. They made barrel staves and barrel heads, but they also had uh, experimented with these salt wells and experimented with um, pumping water down to that salt layer through a pipe that was inside another pipe and then as you, more water was forced down, the brine then would come up the outer pipe and then they could evaporate it. Um, this attempt, however, didn't last. <laughs> However, in 1886, a man named John Alberger came to St. Clair and demonstrated a process uh, he had invented for making a salt, and it, it produced flakes rather than crystals. And the um, it, it said it produced a pure form of salt that was more water soluble, um, and really was desired by uh, food processors. So uh, uh, Moore and Mark Hopkins, a group of Sinclair investors, purchased Dahlberger's uh, patent, and they will form the Diamond Crystal Salt Company. Uh, Hopkins quickly bowed out of the company, though, and uh, it, Charles and Franklin Moore had the company. There was another salt company next door, however, and this was Thompson Brothers. And it had uh, begun uh, business in 1884. It operated till 1906. Their buildings were purchased by Morton Salt. 
Uh, but in 1912, Diamond Crystal purchased their buildings. So the Morris Salt Company became the Diamond Crystal, and it became an important part of the economy of the city ever since. It still is. And generations of St. Clair people worked at the Diamond. Yeah. <laughs> and Diamond Crystal products um, out in the early years were shipped mainly to the East Coast, and uh, much of it was shipped by boat across the St. Clair River to Portwright, and then by rail to New York and to the East Coast. So it's 1871. And a very important uh, event happened, uh, and it was, I suppose, depending on how you look at it, not good for the city. Uh, the county seat was moved to Port Huron. And Port Huron had uh, fought for years to try and get the county seat away from St. Clair. In the 1840s, they made two attempts to get the state legislature to move it. Both times they failed, uh, but they'll try again. Uh, this building was the county jail uh, built about 1845 and was used as the county jail until, I think, 18, 1858. Uh, it's a house today just up the street, uh, the corner of Cass and 6th. Um, it actually was the third jail. The first was in Fulton's back room. The second was in the old courthouse. And then this one. In 1853, that old log courthouse burned. So Port Huron saw their chance to try and get the county seat moved to Port Huron. Um, so St. Clair quickly built a new courthouse and a new jail. And they look remarkably alike. Uh, the courthouse um, was where the old log one was. Uh, it would be in the parking lot of the library today. The new county jail was right behind this building, right here on the corner of Trumbull and Fifth. This worked for a while. Uh, in 1850, the state uh, changed how they decided where a county seat was to be or if it could be changed. The legislature used to just decide. But the new state constitution said that two-thirds of the county board of supervisors had to approve a move and then a majority of the county's voters. So there's going to be several elections, several court cases, so a lot of uh, infighting over whether it's going to be moved or not. In the end, the majority of the voters voted to move it to Port Huron. Of course, that northern end of the county had more people, so more votes. Um, Port Huron didn't have a courthouse to move to, though. So St. Clair said, since they don't have anywhere to move the county government, let it stay here until they do. And that went to the state Supreme Court, and they finally said, no, it has to move now. So it was moved. Uh, Port Huron made available a school for the county courts and offices mm -hmm. until this was built. Uh, which was where McMoran is today. The former courthouse, it became the city hall. And in the 1930s, they added that um, columned portico on the front of it. Uh, the county jail uh, became a school. And the Trumbull Street School, or most people called it the jail school. And there you have students in the jail school.
1887. And this is something that maybe we sh could say, or change some, a practice in St. Clair, but also did nationally. The first flag to fly over an American school took place here in St. Clair. Uh, you know, and oddly enough, I, you know, today we think it odd that schools and public buildings really didn't fly the American flag. But now we see it everywhere. Uh, but in the 19th century, it wasn't the practice. But a school board member, Josiah Smith, thought it should be. He was an immigrant from England, but a very proud citizen of the U.S. He also uh, was the um, Justice of the Peace in St. Clair. And whenever he did business as Justice of the Peace, he raised the American flag, uh, especially when he married uh, anyone, because he considered you know, the flag as a symbol of unity. So he proposed to the Board of Education that we fly the flag at the school. I, he said he'd purchase the flagpole, he would pay to have it installed, so the school board agreed. Uh, bunting was purchased uh, at the Whiting store downtown by the city, the city paid for it, and then four teachers sewed it together. Uh, a mother of one of the teachers, uh, Joanna Palmer, uh, cut the bunting into the, you know, the strips and the stars, uh, and the four young teachers sewed it together. Joanna was a seamstress. And you know, oddly enough, maybe uh, there wasn't a flag you could buy. So they had to make their own. So these are two of the teachers, uh, Martha Palmer and uh, Clara Carlton. The other two were Hattie Waterloo and Letty German. And there is the school, the old Union School on 6th Street. It was located right where the uh, that current, the current school building that is there today, uh, the old intermediate, or old St. Clair High. Mm -hmm. So, I, the flag was raised on the first day of school in September 1887. Uh, a Mrs. Parsons raised it in, because she was the oldest living graduate of St. Clair High School. Um, I'm not, I don't know who she was except in Mrs. Parsons, but we might be able to figure that out uh, because we do know all the graduates of the school. And she couldn't have been that old <laughs> because the first graduating class was like 1867. So she might have only been like 38. <coughs> Uh, Smith hoped to change this practice in St. Clair schools, but it caught on and it spread very rapidly nationwide. In 1902, uh, Smith's nephew, a man named A. A. Morse, displayed the flag that had flown over the St. Clair school in the window of his Lansing drugstore. Uh, they were holding a statewide Grange Convention. And so as part of that celebration, he made this display with this flag. He had inherited from his uncle. And that's something else we could uh, figure out, I think, if he had ever lived here, because there, were, uh, there was a family by that name that lived on 9th Street in the late 1890s, or in the late 1800s. A little article about the first flag. Uh, we can't quite read that all, or not at all. But the article next to it, the longer one, is the school board minutes from 1896. And in it is a letter from Letty German, who was one of the four teachers who made the flag. And it's a letter of resignation, she said, because of poor health, she was resigning. And the school board accepted her resignation and immediately hired another woman to take her place at $35 a month. Uh, Letty German uh, 
later on was the city treasurer. Now, 1878, Mark Hopkins died in San Francisco, well, which seems pretty remote from St. Clair, but this was an event that did have a big impact on uh, the city of St. Clair. Uh, Mark Hopkins had lived here as a boy. His family moved here in the 1820s, and his father, who also was named Mark, uh, was uh, our first postmaster. Uh, but this Mark Hopkins left St. Clair at a very young age and lived at various places around the country and generally was in the hardware business. Uh, during the gold rush in California, he went to California and opened a hardware store, and then another, and then finally this one in Sacramento with a partner, uh, it was Huntington and Hopkins. Uh, so he made a fortune in hardware, but then he made a bigger fortune in railroads because he was one of the big four investors in the Central Pacific Railroad, uh, which went from California and then connected to the Union Pacific, the first transcontinental railroad, and was able to build that big mansion in San Francisco. So when he died, he left part of his fortune, five million, to his brother Samuel and Samuel's sons, Mark, William, and Oren. And they spent some of it and invested some of it here uh, in St. Clair, uh, things like the Congregational Church, um, the two hotels there, they, they owned those. Uh, they started a racetrack uh, north of Brown, which is basically Meldrum Circle area today. Uh, early investor in Diamond Crystal and in other business ventures in town also. I think they uh, had um, some interest in uh, the Wonder Plow Company, which was basically a whiting company, but it made uh, an attachment to plows that made it easier to plow fields. The block of wood, that's a paving block. And the Hopkins paid to pave Riverside Avenue. Uh, they owned a hotel at each end of town and they paved the street between them. And it was paved with those blocks. We have that one here in the museum. And they were, you know, made locally. And here's Samuel Hopkins and his wife, Mary. Uh, they had, Samuel had come uh, with his father, but he was one of the early uh, uh, people who uh, invested in a business with Thomas Palmer. In other words, Palmer financed him in a store uh, in the 18, early 1830s here. But he had done a lot of other things, including was a wallpaper hanger at one time here in town. So it was uh, ordinary things he did for a living all his life until he got all these millions. Along with his son Mark and his son Will or William. And the three, and they built these three houses in town, two of which still stand. Uh, Samuel built the one on the left, which uh, later on was owned by his son, uh, Will. Uh, and on the right is the one built by Mark. So Mark and the Mark Hopkins house and the Samuel Will Hopkins houses were side by side. And you can see they've changed a bit. Uh, the tower towers are different because you have Mark Hopkins' house in the picture where the whole roof uh, has changed, and that's due to fires. There were fires in both, and they did not restore the roof lines to the way they originally were. Warren's house was the one in the middle, and it was on North Riverside on the river side. Um, it was later on owned by the Franklin Moores, and they replaced it with uh, a newer house later on. 
1881. St. Clair <laughs> becomes a resort city. The Oakland Hotel is open, and it's open, and the Hopkins built it. Uh, but it became one of the top resort hotels in the Great Lakes. It was a very large hotel. Its porch was longer than that of the Grand. Uh, it was on a large piece of property at the south end of town, Oakland Avenue. Uh, today, we've gone through their yard. It uh, had all kinds of amenities. Uh, you could come there, and uh, the, one of the big draws were the mineral baths. Uh, people thought it was very helpful to take the baths, so they'd come here to do that. But they could go boating, uh, horseback riding, there was a bowling alley, tennis courts, you could go picnicking, uh, there was an orchestra, you could, you could dance on summer evenings. Uh, sometimes it was played on the porch, uh, and there you have a picture of the porch. So this became an important uh, part of the economy of the city and the social life of the city. A lot of local events took place here. There are the parlors, the dining room, the front desk, and that's a balcony on the second floor. The bathhouse was on the south end of the building. Uh, there you have a picture of one of the baths. Doesn't look too inviting, but <laughs> they thought it was good for you. Uh, and a waiting room. And there were two waiting rooms, one for men and one for women. Uh, the waters, the mineral waters, uh, they were considered good to drink. And they, that's what they served in the dining room. They also will be bottled here and sold, at, uh, which will become Salutaris. Now in 1888, they opened this second hotel at the north end of town, <coughs> right before the city limits. Uh, part of this building was originally built in 1880, the two-story park, and it was a girls' school for eight years. The Somerville School. And then in 1888, the Hopkins uh, enlarged it. They added that wing on uh, the one end, a uh, three story wing. And then another wing on the back, which had mineral baths in it, too. So this was very much like the Oakland, and maybe a little bit smaller version, had a lot of the same activities you could engage in and had the baths. And its lawn went right down to the River. The hotel would have been on the west side of Riverside Avenue today, but just on the west side. In the early days, most visitors to the hotels came by boat, by steamer from Detroit. Uh, and these are some of the ships that stopped at the hotel. The Idlewild, the Greyhound were frequent uh, visitors here. And then uh, the Tajman, which stopped here daily in the summers. After 1900, you could also come by uh, electric train from Detroit on the interurban, it's the old picture in the top, uh, which was a very convenient, easy way to get here uh, from 1900 to the early 1930s. Nineteen twenty-six, well, we have the opening of the St. Clair Inn, and this was a project spearheaded by the Rotary Club. Uh, the Oakland wa had closed in nineteen fifteen. There later was a fire in the building, and it was damaged, so they tore it down. Uh, the uh, Somerville closed by nineteen twenty, and it was torn down, and the land subdivided. So uh, the Rotary was thinking, we need a hotel here, a community hotel, which uh, there were other community hotels around the country. 
So they began this effort to start this and uh, a corporation was formed and they sold stock and a lot of local people bought stock in the Sinclair Inn. And we have some of the stock certificates here in the museum. It's a Tudor style building. Uh, it was designed by a portier and architect, Walter Wyeth, who designed, had earlier designed the Sperry's building. And he had his office on the third floor of the Sperry's building. He had also designed the old uh, Marysville High School, that was torn down recently. Uh, he designed the parsonage at the Congregational Church here in town. And I think he also designed that brick house that's just north of the St. Clarine. And these are early pictures. Uh, you can see the porches are still open. They haven't been enclosed. This uh, successfully uh, brought people to St. Clair again, visitors, tourists who would come to uh, stay at the inn. The inn was fireproof after all, so they advertised that in big letters on their sign. Um, and I, that was because it, it's built of concrete uh, and air conditioned somehow. We haven't figured out how. <laughs> uh, A lot of well-known people stayed there over the years, uh, including uh, Ginger Rogers, Fess Parker, uh, the Detroit Pistons. And the Pistons would have you know, like summer camps here. They would uh, practice at the Marysville High School gym, and then later on they practice at the St. Clair High School gym. The Detroit Tigers would come, and in 1970, that's what these pictures are from. They're at the Little League Park here in uh, St. Clair. Fletcher Park. And their wives and children are enjoying the pool up at uh, the golf club. Early on, Creighton Holden was hired to manage the inn, and he will own 49% of the, the company. In 1946, he and his two sons, Creighton Jr. and Robert, uh, purchased the other 51%, so they owned uh, the entire company. And local people uh, enjoyed the inn as well. Here's the lobby and the coach room, which was uh, not original, but a, a later early addition. Local events often took place there. There was a women's banquet of some kind there. The Sinclair Dance Club is there, and they uh, met there regularly. Uh, we have a little boy uh, in his family celebrating his first communion at the inn. <laughs> and we have another special event that took place at the inn in March of 2008. Uh, the city was celebrating uh, the sesquicentennial of St. Clair becoming a city. And in uh, 1858, they had celebrated with a grand ball at the city hotel. So we did that here in St. Clair to celebrate the 150th anniversary. Weddings have taken place there ever since 1926. And Bell Martin and Erwin Engelgau were married that year and their reception was held at the inn. This is a 2002 wedding at the inn, which is our daughter's wedding. <laughs> St. Clair people um, worked at the inn, you know, for 90 years. Uh, you know, some of the waitresses and those people standing uh, on those poles are waiters and waitresses. <laughs> I think the, the picture on the um, left is probably 1960s. The one on the right is in the 1980s. 
I used to do that in front of the customers. I was just at North and Randy Foster was calling me about it. He said, I mean, look at how they'd have to get up there. They'd have to shimmy up there. And a lot of times they had a, a can of beer. They would all sit there and they'd drink the beer and then they'd dive in and all the customers would applaud. <laughs> Kim Moreski, who teaches at the high school, was one of them. Yeah. He gave us of these pictures, in fact, of uh, oh. them doing that. <laughs> uh, some people like a lot of those uh, young waiters, waitresses, worked summers, but some worked for uh, a lifetime career at the end. We need to get some of her recipes. Yeah. Evelyn Cower was kind of legendary for her pies. Okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. 1945, and a very significant uh, that era, a, a new industry really is the plastics industry. And this is one of the places where it really was born. Um, there was a, a company called Standard Products. Uh, which was an Illinois company, but they had plants across the country. And they got involved in making uh, plastics, and they had their thermoplastics division here in St. Clair. And I'm not sure the year it was established, but I know it was here, you know, through wor throughout World War II. Uh, and in 1945, they were awarded the Army, e Army Navy E for Excellence Award, and they produced all sorts of uh, parts for things used in the war, from uh, uh, gas masks to uh, you know, electrical contact breakers, uh, flashlight cases, all sorts of things. Um, they were on Putty Gut Road. Uh, these are pictures. Uh, from 1945 of people working at thermoplastics and Christmas celebration. The woman in the lower right is Jeanette Ingalls. And here's the plant as it was in 1945. Uh, the company, uh, Thermoplastics, went out of business here in 1953, but you know, it helped get this whole industry here started, and then we soon had blue water plastics, Pine River Plastics, Huron, and a variety of other companies here in St. Clair and in uh, Marine City and Marysville elsewhere. And of course, they came to uh, specialize in parts for the auto industry. Okay, 1967, uh, urban renewal. And uh, people begin to think, you know, the downtown St. Clair to uh, make it uh, a viable, needed, a shot in the arm. So, Planning began to take place, and we learned recently one of the people who, behind the scenes, really started that was Creighton Holden. Um, the Federal Department of Urban Development, um, HUD, uh, was willing to take on this project, and this is going to end up being their first completed project of this sort. Uh, and what it called for was really demolishing the downtown and rebuilding. Uh, where all that rubble is, is where they were clearing for the mall, the new Riverview Plaza. And look what we've got now. <laughs> the previous picture had my, my old story. Uh, no, the one before the this. one before that. Yeah. Uh, 
there. Right up in the yeah. upper right. Store. The right. upper right. There's the, the building the bar on the left. and mm -hmm. and my store. Yeah. Mar Marlene and I store. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just shot there. The old city hall is part of this too. The library was built and built right next to the old city hall uh, in these pictures, 1966-1967, just before they began the actual work on, on the urban renewal. Uh, so 1967 uh, is just before they demolished the city hall. Uh, so that would have been uh, right in the parking lot of the library. Um, the whole project included a lot of other buildings besides the Riverview Plaza. Um, additional housing uh, was built in uh, Palmer Manor and in Langley Circle, which is off Brown Street. Uh, Langley Circle were originally cooperatives. Uh, today, I believe they are condominiums. Uh, but it also included, some, you know, other buildings. The first building actually uh, completed in the new uh, project was Carmen Cleaners on 3rd Street and then the office building next to that and then eventually uh, a new bank, new office building, new auto dealership and a new park. Uh, <coughs> the uh, old park uh, basically was um, down where the arch is and north of that. So they expanded the park all the way from the Voyager to the inn. And a new boat harbor, which opened in 19, the spring of 1970. And this is a, a 1970 uh, photo of the boat harbor, so right after it was uh, completed that first summer. On October 10th, 1970, St. Clair celebrated the uh, completion of this project, the Impossible Dream uh, Festival. And it was a big deal. It lasted for a week. Uh, there were lots of speeches. Uh, Secretary of HUD George Romney came. Uh, Governor William Milliken. Uh, there were parade. There was a parade. There were musical events. There. <coughs> were uh, balloon ascensions, a lot of different activities. And here's the crowd. And, uh, you know, this whole project uh, changed uh, what St. Clair is going to be like. Uh, it became a very different city. So, from a frontier fort to a modern Midwest city, the one constant has always been change. The big building in the upper right, by the way, which looks like it's abandoned, was, that's the Oakland Hotel, uh, in the process of being torn down. And one of my favorite pictures, City Hall and at Christmas time. <laughs> So we thank you all for coming. Thank you.